Well, listen, it is my task at the moment, uh, and a very pleasant one indeed, to uh, introduce Bill O'Neill. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have uh, uh, are aware of, of who Bill is and uh, certainly why his most recent uh, accomplishments uh, in uh, this uh, nation's and in humanity's uh, surge outward into space uh, have been. But uh, let me let me warm you up to uh, to his presentation, which I'm uh, really anxious to, to hear and see as well as you are. But let me warm you up to something. I think this is a man of uh, of great skill and accomplishment and capability. And uh, I want you to know a little bit more about him. But he just educated me in fact that uh, he was uh, not just born at MKE, but he was born in Milwaukee. See on this piece of paper, he had written MKE, and I haven't flown into the Milwaukee airport often enough to have my bags tagged with MKE to know what MKE was. It was MKE. He was born in Milwaukee, raised uh, in Hartford, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, Bill received his uh, BS degree in aeronautical engineering from Purdue, Dale Purdue, with distinction in 1961, and has a master's in aeronautical uh, engineering from USC. He worked at Boeing and Lockheed prior to joining JPL in 63. And his assignments at uh, JPL have included trajectory design and navigation for surveyor, as uh, most folks, all folks around here know all too well, uh, uh, was uh, one of the first spacecraft to uh, soft land on our nearest planetary, we think of it that way, right? Don't we? <laughs> Neighbor. Navigation uh, Chief uh, for uh, Mariner Mars 71, the first U.S. spacecraft to orbit another world. Navigation Chief for Viking, Manager of JPL's Mission Design Department. Bill served as Science and Mission Design Manager for Project Galileo during its development phase. And then in February of 90, Bill was appointed Galileo Project Manager. The spacecraft, uh, an orbiter, and uh, an entry probe arrived, as, as we know, at Jupiter on December 7th, 95, becoming the first to penetrate the atmosphere of an outer planet, and the first to orbit an outer planet. On its circuitous route, Galileo became the first spacecraft to perform asteroid flybys as well. Gaspera in October of 91, and Ida in uh, August of 93. Project Galileo discovered uh, the first uh, natural satellite of an asteroid, Ida, and uh, the first ever uh, sighting of an, of an, well, as I just said, the first asteroid. asteroid. You know, I'm, I'm trying to read this and uh, improvise at the same time, but sometimes you get caught up, and uh, you, you just got to laugh at that. <laughs> the Galileo orbiter successfully completed its two-year primary mission scientific tour of uh, the Jupiter system on uh, December 7, 97, two years after it arrived, and is now in the extended Jupiter tour mm -hmm. mission to the end of this century. In February 98, uh, Bill was appointed chief technologist for the Mars Exploration Program at JPL. He's honored with NASA's highest award, the Distinguished Service Medal, the Purdue Distinguished uh, Engineering Alumni Award, and an honorary doctorate from uh, the University of Padua, Italy, Galileo's University. And that is the chief, that's great. He resides with his wife in uh, Sierra Madre, California, a suburb of L.A. And they have three adult children and uh, one grandchild, me too, two years old. His outside interests include travel, downhill skiing, and real estate investment. <laughs> yeah, outside interest. Doesn't say a hobby, it says an outside interest. And uh, certainly not least of all, you got lots of good things to uh, look forward from uh, this very talented and accomplished uh, individual because he's currently managing the team for the Mars Sample Return Mission, now scheduled for 2005 launch. Bill, please come on up.
tonight I can talk about the things we have done at you. And I think you'll agree with me that it has been a spectacular success. Another reason is that I was born 20 blocks from uh, where I'm standing right now. So this makes it a, a great night. on Saturday afternoon and we were scheduled to go out and talk to an elementary school, a large room full of elementary students, and uh, Charlie was detained for some reason, and I had a pinch hit for the first hour. And so I walked in, and the first thing I heard was, are you an astronaut? <laughs> and I said, no. We didn't think so. <laughs> so I think it's only appropriate that you uh, introduce me tonight, Charlie. Well, with that uh, bit of introduction, I'd like to get uh, right started. This is uh, Galileo is certainly a study in perseverance, as most of you know, and uh, there's a real lesson there. I uh, often call this talk agony and ecstasy. <laughs> I think you will see why as we go through. Give me the first slide, next slide, please, and, and drop the last. And by the way, please feel free. My wife has commanded me that I'm not allowed to talk more than 30 minutes. So if you feel like standing in the back to get a better view, it should be uh, uh, tolerable. So go ahead, go ahead and hit the, give us the next slide. Okay, well, here, here's Jupiter. Uh, just to uh, give you a reference, it is uh, the giant, of course, this is the Earth to the same scale as Jupiter. Volume of Earth would fit in the volume of Jupiter 1,400 times. Two-thirds of all the mass outside the Sun in the solar system is contained by the Jupiter system. So if you scooped up everything else outside the Sun, you'd only have half of what Jupiter contains. Next. And there again is that image of the Earth over the red spot. We go in the red spot about three times. Next. And the a horrendous magnetosphere largest object in volume in the solar system, 100 times the volume of the sun. Deep inside this magnetosphere, we have 16 known natural satellites. In fact, the last four of those were discovered by NASA spacecraft. I'm delighted to tell you that we now know of 17 satellites of Jupiter, the 17th being the first artificial satellite of Jupiter, the Galileo spacecraft. <laughs> And the first four to be discovered were those discovered by Galileo in 1610. Next. And they are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, uh, shown here. Uh, upper panel is the oblique views of circular, the circular orbits of those moons around Jupiter to the scale of Jupiter. It's interesting that Io goes around Jupiter just about the same distance as our moon from the Earth, but it completes the orbit every 42 hours because of the tremendous gravity of Jupiter compared to that of Earth. Europa is at uh, about twice the distance of uh, Io and uh, completes an orbit in half a week. Ganymede is a one-week period in Callisto, two weeks. These are all, as you can see easily here, highly differentiated bodies and very important in their own right. Io was determined by Voyager in the late 70s to be the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Europa was thought to be almost a little bit disinteresting cue ball, and uh, that's, you will, well, most of you already know, Europa has been the big exciting thing uh, from the Galileo mission, the evidence, strong evidence of uh, liquid water under the surface. Uh, Ganymede and Flisto, very uh, icy old surfaces, perhaps half the age of the system. Next. Galileo, of course, got in a great deal of trouble uh, when he discovered these satellites and proclaimed that Copernicus was right after all, that the Earth, in fact, does circulate around the sun and not the other way around. And the church, his sponsors, of course, took a very dim view. Those, uh, that expression there is very familiar to us. It's what we saw on NASA headquarters spaces. <laughs> throughout the 80s as we were trying to get this thing launched. So, and uh, to his credit, Pope John Paul II did exonerate Galileo in, in uh, October of 92 of any wrongdoing in asserting that in fact the Earth is not the center of the universe and in fact revolves around the sun. Next one. 
Well, we finally got it straightened out all together. <laughs> In January of 97, after our first uh, Europa uh, high resolution images were obtained, the project scientists Torrance Johnson and myself met, had an audience with uh, Pope John Paul II and presented some of our results. And he was duly impressed and he, uh, proclaimed a wow when he saw our, our first Europa image. Next. And another uh, illustration of the uh, magnificence of these bodies, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, compared to Mars, for example, remarkably, here, this moon of Jupiter is three quarters the size of the planet Mars. So they truly are uh, planet sized bodies. Here's Titan's, uh, Titan, the main moon of Saturn, Earth, and Venus, of course, and Mercury in our own moon. Next. We have three co-equal scientific, scientific objectives for Project Galileo, and that is investigate the chemical composition and physical state of the atmosphere, the satellites, and also the structure and physical dynamics of the magnetosphere. Next. As you heard, we were the first mission to penetrate, and so, so far, of course, still the only mission to penetrate an outer planet atmosphere. This is the descent module at Kennedy Space Center just before encapsulation. And this is the parachute it descended on and the antenna to communicate the information to the mothership overhead. This, by the way, is the, the cover over the net flux radiometer, which is a Wisconsin instrument. The principal investigator, uh, Larry Shemowski at the University of Wisconsin, for that particular investigation. A total of seven investigations on the descent module, including two from Germany. <laughs> a cartoon of the uh, orbiter mothership uh, we won't spend much time with this, but I want to point out to you it's the first, in fact, the only dual spin planetary spacecraft. Everything above this interface spins continuously, typically at three revolutions per minute. Below the interface, we have a de-spun section, spin bearing on the center line, electric motors. We drive that, those motors at exactly the same rate as the upper section is spinning, but opposite directions. So the result is we have a three-axis stable spacecraft here and a spinner here. We have our telescopic instruments on the despun platform, including a very high resolution solid state imaging camera. This, in fact, is the first CCD on a planetary mission, an ultraviolet spec, a near infrared mapping spectrometer, and a photopolarimeter radiometer on that uh, platform. On the spinning side, we, have, we spin for two equally important reasons to keep for stability, but also to provide a continuously rotating platform for the fields and particles instruments, of which we have six including a magnetometer at the end of this magnetometer boom. <coughs> We're powered by uh, uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators too, producing power of about 500 watts, or about a third of the hair, hair dryers running the spacecraft. This is the infamous high gain antenna that never did deploy, and we've done all our communications over a very small antenna at the top of the the central uh, tower here that has gives us a power density on Earth about 10,000 times below what we were designed to receive. So the in-flight uh, rework in order to do this mission under those circumstances was quite phenomenal. This is the propulsion system built by Messerschmitt in Germany and supplied to the U.S. free of charge as part of their international cooperation with us on the mission. Probe carried in the belly of the orbiter here. And this is the antenna that received the data from the probe. The sole function was to receive data from the probe and then the orbiter transmitted it to Earth. Next. Just a photograph in our assembly facility at JPL to show you the size of the Galileo orbiter. Next. And uh, about that agony and ecstasy and perseverance, I wanted to share with you uh, the history of the development program. Galileo will be 21 years old in uh, this fall, so I see by the booklet for the conference that uh, in Wisconsin, Galileo could drink. <laughs> and uh, through this period it would have been helpful. <laughs> in fact, when the project was approved as a fiscal 78 new start in the fall of 77, we were to launch in January of 82 on a so-called three-stage IUS that was going to be specially developed for the planetary program uh, using the basis of the Boeing uh, two-stage and twin-stage IUSs. This never got off the uh, drawing board, and in fact, it was in 1979 that it was determined that uh, 
not only would this vehicle not be ready, but of course the shuttle, space shuttle wouldn't be ready to launch Galileo at that time either. That was our first slip, first reprogramming, reprogrammed to a launching uh, in 84, and the geometry was uh, sufficient, enough poorer then. And of course there had been a dead, uh, quite a race on to see whether the spacecraft could increase in mass faster on the drawing boards or the launch vehicle could lose capability faster. <laughs> so with the, that divergence and, and the loss and uh, the near optimal geometry for the 82 launch, it turned out we had to split the mission into two separate launches, contract with Hughes, who built the probe by the way, or a pro probe carrier to take it separately to Jupiter and build a fly-by liquid propulsion system to go by Mars and give it an extra boost so we could make it. But then there was a change in administration and they said, oh, well, we have a solution. We're going to develop a wide-body centaur, fill up the shuttle bay, both in volume and, and cargo capability. That would cost us a year, but it allowed us to uh, put the vehicle spacecraft back together, probe and orbit together on this uh, proposed high energy upper stage and launch on a direct trajectory to Jupiter. It wasn't even a year later that uh, it was decided that by NASA this was not to be developed after all. And so it was in the uh, fall of 81 when we were asked for the options. If this were not to be done, how could we do it? We said we'd take a two-stage IUS that was for sure going to fly, build a JPL kickstage, and sacrifice some of the mission at Jupiter, fewer encounters because we wouldn't have enough propellant to get it all done. Take a two-year uh, orbit around the sun to get an extra boost to get to Jupiter. And that was, uh, that was accepted. And in fact, it was just in uh, July of 82 that we were informing the new Associate Administrator for Space Science that this is how we're going to do it. And that very afternoon, the word came over from the Hill Congress never said you could cancel this. You must develop it. <laughs> Cross that out. Do this again. So we lost lost another year, but we were back on for an 86 uh, May 86 launch on the Centaur. And in fact, the Galileo spacecraft, probe and orbiter, and the Centaur, uh, newly developed high energy uh, wide body upper stage, all at Kennedy Space Center, ready for launch when the Challenger accident occurred. And uh, in the wake of that accident, it was determined that this was too dangerous to fly in the shuttle. And we were left with only the two-stage IUS to do this mission. And in fact, during the summer of 86, we had no way to get Galileo. We, we knew of no way to get it to Jupiter because this stage could only get us to either Venus or Mercury, excuse me, Venus or Mars. And it turned out the trajectory designers found a miraculous, uh, totally counterintuitive way to do that. And this is the system that we actually used and took a, a crazy trajectory to get to Mars. Next. It's October 18th, 1989, and you can imagine after what I've just shown you how delighted we were to get out of town. <laughs> There's a perfect launch on the Atlantis SDS-34, next. A perfect deployment, this is the limb of Earth, of course, next. And there we have uh, Galileo attached to the two-stage IUS, drifting away from the shuttle to uh, ignite two-thirds of a rev later and put us on our trajectory off in the wrong direction, next. So this, what I refer to as a crazy trajectory, at launch, we put all of the launch energy into slowing down, did a retro maneuver. Instead of speeding up to go to Jupiter, did a retro maneuver to fall in toward the sun, arrive at Venus in February of 90, got a gravity assist from Venus, put us on a trajectory back to the Earth, flew by the Earth December the 8th of 90, very precise gravity assist to put us in exactly a two-year orbit around the sun, came back to the Earth December the 8th of 1992, got a final gravity boost, that put us in a six-year orbit around the sun, halfway around. Three years after that boost, we were at Jupiter's distance. Jupiter is uh, moving about twice as fast as Galileo was, in fact, just target out in front, and Jupiter overtook us, and in the case of the probe, literally ran into the probe. Now, you don't get something for nothing. It is a fact that every time we use one of these gravity assists, the spacecraft pulled back on the Earth and slowed it down a little bit in orbit. 
<laughs> but little enough that we didn't even file an environmental impact statement. <laughs> That we, no telling whether we can get away with that today. In any case, uh, I emphasize the only reason we took this trajectory was it was the only way we could get to Jupiter. But given that, given that we we're on the scenic route, we definitely were going to take every opportunity to take science on the way, and surely did next. While we're once we are in interplanetary flight, of course, we do all of our control by radio through the deep space network developed by JPL and operated by JPL for NASA. We have tracking complexes in California, near Madrid, and near Canberra. And by having these 120 degrees apart as the Earth rotates, you can always uh, see any of the spacecraft from one of those sites. Some never sits on the Deep Space Network. Next one. And at each of those sites, we have one principal antenna, 70 meter in diameter. And because we didn't get our antenna open, and we had this very low power density, it's only these antennas that can acquire a signal from Galileo. So uh, we're fortunate that we had have those at each of the complexes. Next. This is uh, JPL on a, a day so clear I can't believe it. <laughs> this is our solar thermal vacuum chamber where we test the spacecraft under space conditions before we ship to the launch site. The construction of the spacecraft is done in this area, and we're operating Galileo from this building. Next. This is our first Earth gravity assist. This is a planned view where here's, here's the Earth, of course, the orbit of the moon. You see Galileo come streaming in here and get a, a accelerated by the Earth. That sharp bending, of course, indicates the acceleration of the Earth on the spacecraft to change its path and accelerate it in this direction. Sun's over here, and of course we want to speed up and go faster around the sun in order to get to Jupiter ultimately. Notice that we covered the distance from uh, the moon to the Earth in under 11 hours, where typically it takes uh, three days to get to the moon or get back from the moon next. This is the uh, Earth track of that first encounter, quite remarkable in that it was almost the same route that Columbus took. <laughs> Absolutely coincidental, of course, but more, more pertinent is it was, uh, again, December of 90, just as the Gulf War was getting going, and you see that the track could, very much, could look very much like a missile coming from the Gulf toward uh, Florida. So we were very careful to talk to our colleagues at Cheyenne Mountain. <laughs> do, not, do not shoot us down. <laughs> Next. As we left the Earth that first time, we took this... Uh, 40 frame mosaic of Antarctica. This is the continent of Antarctica. South Pole is right about there. The rest of what you see is ice or cloud cover. Next. And from two and a half to three and a half days after that Earth gravity assist, we took a, an image every minute cycling through six different filters so we could produce the first ever space view of the Earth completing a full rotation on its axis. And we'll show that at the end of the talk. Next. Our most important interplanetary objective turned out to be to encounter an asteroid. So Galileo spacecraft was the first spacecraft ever to encounter an asteroid. This is gas for about 20 kilometers in length. Obviously, it has had a very rough existence, got beat up pretty badly. It's important to realize that before this image, all asteroids were points of light in telescopes. Nobody had any idea what the surface of an asteroid truly looked like. Next. And on the second Earth gravity uh, assist, we came uh, right over the North Pole of the Moon, about, right about there, and afforded us an opportunity to take many images of the North Polar region. Next. And I have to emphasize, there are ten, total of ten instruments, or well, me, ten other instruments in addition to the camera on the Galileo spacecraft. The images are always the easiest to display, but I want to emphasize that all eleven of those instruments on the orbiter continue to produce uh, excellent data. And eight days after the second Earth gravity assist, we look back and could capture the moon and the earth in the same frame. And we'll show you the video of the moon traversing the earth. Next. And it was a double header on our uh, second pass through the asteroid belt. We encountered asteroid Ida. And as Charlie mentioned, we captured an image, discovered a moonlet in orbit about Ida. And because we could image this moonlet and determine its orbit, that allowed us to determine the mass. We couldn't fly close enough to the 
is to determine the mass for obvious reasons, a little bit of inaccuracy might have ended the mission a bit too soon. <laughs> but in any case, the images gave us the volume, so with the mass and volume, we could get density, which is not something that we could count on doing a priori next. And if you're not impressed with the size of Ida, here it is on the freeway map of LA. Here's Pasadena, here's Long Beach. I don't think it'd be any tougher to drive on Ida than in LA. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it wouldn't be safer. <laughs> Next. So uh, we completed the preliminaries. In fact, in the summer of 94, just after that conference in Toronto, uh, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact, uh, fragments impacted Jupiter, and Galileo had the only piece of glass. Every piece of glass on the Earth was pointed at Jupiter, but we had the only piece of glass that had a front row seat. We could actually see the impacts happening, whereas everybody else had to wait for the impact site to rotate into view. Here then is again is our arrival at Jupiter on December 7th of 95 and notice that it was five months earlier that we had to release the probe and the probe had no control system so the orbiter had to very precisely refine the trajectory and then reorient and align the spin axis which is also the probe spin axis to what would be the entry velocity vector at Jupiter spin up to 10 rpm and release it and I submit to you that that is the greatest rifle shot of all time it's 80 million kilometers, 50 million miles, hitting an entry quarter just three degrees in width at Jupiter, five months later. Next. And it should also note that once we cut the umbilical, we had no way to communicate to the, to the probe. Only when both vehicles got to Jupiter, three o'clock the afternoon of December the 7th in Pasadena, when the signal was received from the probe, was received by the orbiter, would we know that the thing had succeeded? Can you imagine the anxiety of waiting for that signal? Here is that the probe trajectory then into Jupiter. It turned out that it was uh, really spot on. We used very little of our margins in, uh, in terms of errors. Two weeks after releasing the probe, of course, we had to deflect the orbiter, otherwise we'd follow the probe right in and we'd get nothing. And imagine, imagine this, that, that that two weeks after probe release marked the first space firing of our main engine. We couldn't use it until that time. So it was, and, and it had been a year earlier that we had lost the Mars Observer spacecraft in a similar situation. So you can imagine how many fine tooth combs went over the propulsion system here and in Germany before uh, we made that maneuver, and it was uh, spot on. Orbiter then flew more or less like a chase plane but, and was uh, targeted to be right overhead of the probe as the probe descended to receive the relay data from the probe for a total of 75 minutes uh, listening time. We also were targeted to precisely fly by Io, not only at 1,000, we actually went by at 900 to get a gravity assist for the first time to use gravity assist to slow down so we didn't have to use quite as much propellant to do the Jupiter orbit insertion maneuver. Next. And here's an artist's rendering of the, the probe at the staging event. This is the toughest entry in the solar system outside the sun. If you want to go to Jupiter, you're coming from basically infinitely far away, and this gravity is going to accelerate you so that you're going over 100,000 miles an hour when you hit that atmosphere. So we hit the atmosphere at that speed, and in two minutes, took that speed down to about 1% of that. The probe and all the instruments on it survived 228 Gs. And this heat shield in front of it protected the probe from temperatures of 25,000 degrees Fahrenheit, twice the surface temperature of the sun. Once uh, the, the, the staging was complete, the descent module descended vertically on the chute, and all the instruments uh, operated successfully, and in fact, we got to twice our pressure depth requirement and operated for a total of 58 minutes. We had data coming from the probe to the orbiter, and the orbiter stayed in lock on that signal for the entire time. We, uh, in terms of the scientific determinations, we're, we found that all the con this con constituents that we were most interested in, in, in most cases, were two to three times the relative abundance that we find on the sun except for water, and as 
most of you know, it turned out that the Galileo probe entered a dry spot on Jupiter, and we have since, with the orbiter water sounding, found that there's many orders of magnitude difference in water vapor uh, across Jupiter and entirely explain the uh, apparent lack of water in that particular location. Next. So having uh, done the probe mission and we did the orbit search maneuver and went into the largest orbit that we dared to to remain captured, which is depicted here. These inner rings are the orbits of Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. First orbit, seven months long, targeted to arrive at Ganymede on June 27th, 96. We had a total of 10 targeted encounters in 11 orbits. Notice there's nothing done on the fifth because we're behind the sun then. The foundation of this is on every orbit to very precisely navigate to fly close to one of the satellites and get a gravity assist to change the orbit to the next one so we can go to the next satellite we want to visit and that way bootstrap our way through the system. Next. And because of our antenna problem, we basically had to do a complete brain transplant of Galileo en route. And in fact, from 1993 to 1996, in fact, and just before that first encounter, we managed to build new software in Pasadena and send it to the spacecraft so that we could compress, do data compression in the order of 10 to 20 to 1, and a lot of editing. So the, the uh, mission scenario is that at each of the encounters, we would fill up our tape recorder with the images and other high-rate data for about one week, and then during the cruise part of the orbit, incrementally read the tape recorder out, compressing and editing the data, setting it down to the Earth, to the deep space network, we had, in, the, in parallel, improved the receiving capability of the network by a factor of 10. So we actually boosted our information rate to the order of a factor of 100. And in that way, got this mission back up to where we were getting about a kilobit per second out of it and actually achieved, uh, we would claim, uh, easily more than our original objectives. Next one. So now very quickly through some of my favorite images from Galileo. This is the red spot of Jupiter. Next. And a face-on view of that in false color where the colors indicate different cloud uh, heights and also allow us to do circulation calculations. Next. And here's a typical uh, dry spot such as the one the probe went into, but not, uh, not this is not where the probe entered. These, uh, to give you an idea of scale, the Earth would be about this size. Next. And natural color, false color of another such region. Next. And the ring of Jupiter. Saturn is not alone as far as rings, but of course nothing is uh, dramatic as Saturn's. Next. Iowa, the pizza pie, as, <laughs> as we said, most volcanically active body in the solar system. Next. Here we have uh, an image from Galileo showing a plume on the limb as well as a plume here and here are enlargements and this is actually the shadow of that plume. In this extended mission we're doing we expect to fly almost through one of those plumes of Io. Next. That was pretty close, yeah. This is uh, also quite remarkable. These images taken by Galileo are about four months apart and you can see that this volcano has, volcano has erupted and, and uh, spewed uh, out over an area the size of Arizona, just in the time that we've been observing. Next. This is our darling, of course. This is Europa, natural color and false color. Next. This is an early image that we took of Europa, not on one of our encounters with Europa, but rather when we were going past Ganymede, so it's considerably longer range, but very intriguing seeing these blocks of ice and obviously it's like a jigsaw puzzle it could all be shoved back together again. So the first hint that we actually had a situation where blocks of ice were moving on some fluid bearing. Next. <coughs> this is the image in fact that we showed to uh, Pope John Paul and uh, again it's actually uh, two images uh, mosaic here. But you, although we can't exactly date these events, it's, it's clear to see which events followed which others. So surface, it's a bowl of beaches. Next. 
this is about a couple of kilometers across these separations and reprisings next. This uh, region is where we found what we consider the smoking gun, the icebergs next. We, we call these also ice rafts, and these, these features, uh, the resolution of this image is the order of 50 meters, and these features can be the order of uh, 10 kilometers in length. And it's very clear in examining this image that we do have a situation where when this surface was formed, this ice was breaking up and being, uh, the currents were actually moving these uh, ice rafts around. No slopes, no wind, so it can only be current. So a very a clear evidence of a liquid being present. Now it could be, though we just photographed the surface last year, it could be the surface formed uh, 10 or 20 or 50 million years ago, but that's still an instant of time in geologic time. So we say if there was liquid there supporting this movement of these ice rafts then, it's inconceivable that it is all frozen out in the instant of time since. So that leads us to conclude that there's very, a very, very good possibility of liquid, a lot of liquid water under this ice surface. And in conjunction with the recent discoveries of life in the deep in the seafloor where sunlight never reaches, gives us powerful arguments that in fact, the first life found off the Earth may be at Europa, not Mars. Next. And there is that image compared to San Francisco Bay. Give you an idea of scale. Next. And here's an example of a, a, a we call it the puddle. It's uh, two miles across. Could have been water upwelling or, or melting of water due to uh, uh, some heating on the surface. Next. And there, again, uh, compared to San Francisco. Next. And, and now, uh, this is an image it was taken in our extended mission that began uh, December the 8th of last year of the Europa surface. Next. And this, this very dramatic ridge is about uh, two kilometers across. Next one. Now, I'm showing you these in the order from innermost to outermost, not in the order that they were obtained. This was our, from our very first encounter. This is Ganymede. This is a Voyager, highest Voyager resolution of this area. And this is the Galileo image of the same area. It totally changed the scientific interpretation of the surface of Ganymede. It was thought that fluid flows had formed this. And as soon as the scientists saw this, they said, there's plate tectonics going on. We have the equivalent of earthquakes going on on Ganymede. Next. And here are four uh, mosaic images from that region superimposed upon the Voyager best resolution of that area. So you see a very dramatic improvement. Next. And this is another region on Ganymede that is called Galileo Reggio. And uh, see here a large crater about 20 kilometers in diameter and not to be undone, uh, outdone by the base on Mars. We find a base here. Mm -hmm. And we find a man with a turban on. I've lost him, but he's right over here somewhere. Maybe he did leave. No, there he is. Oh, next. And, and here we have an image of Callisto. And why the ragged edge? Because we didn't get all the compression done on time. Next. A very big surprise, some sort of powdery substance covering everything in this region of Callisto and the scientists do not have any idea yet of the source of that material or what's causing that. Next. The same uh, material. Next. Now, I've shown you images, of course. There are some things that we can uh, detect pretty dramatically as well. And we, in fact, use the Doppler tracking of the radio signal as we go by the bodies to determine the gravity harmonics of the body and that way in further internal structure. And we have determined that Ganymede is a, has three structural phases to it, a 
metallic core and then uh, rock and then ice. And our fields and particles instruments have determined Ganymede to be the first moon of the solar system who have a magnetic field. It's the first confirmation of a magnetic, intrinsic magnetic field of a moon in the solar system. Callisto has no such field and is basically uniform as determined by Galileo. And uh, we're, we're still, the vote is still out on Iowa. We're waiting for our encounters at the end of next year to determine the situation there, although we know for sure that it has an uh, iron core about half its diameter, as illustrated there. Next. And the mission that's presently being executed, the Galileo Europa mission, this extension that will take us to the end of the century, we're now executing eight consecutive encounters, the next one coming up at the end of the month here on the 31st. And then in the uh, next year, we will be using Callisto, four consecutive encounters of Callisto, not to investigate Callisto, but to use gravity assist from Callisto to lower the low point of the orbit so we can once again reach Io. And we expect to do two encounters of Io at the, in the last quarter of 99, and these are near kamikaze attempts because, of course, the radiation is horrendous there, and we're already way past what our radiation design uh, budget is. But uh, we're going to give it everything we can, and uh, with any luck, we will succeed. Next. And these are just a few more shots quickly that have come back from this extended mission. Next. Of Europe. Next. 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 Here you're seeing six meter resolution. So you're seeing, uh, and again, we're, we're talking, this is all being done robotically a half a billion miles from Earth. Next, I think there may be one. Yes, that's, that's the last one. So uh, now we will switch on the video projector and show you, as promised, the uh, Earth rotation and the moon transit and then some uh, quick animation. And you can imagine 
in the early days of the program especially, we would have been, we would have settled for less. But it was uh, completely successful. And you will see now that in uh, last summer, we took uh, special efforts to get a deep penetration opposite the sun into the magneto tail of Jupiter to measure the fields and particles there. And now we're coming up on what was our tenth and final encounter of the primary mission. And it used to be the money was going to run out right there, but happily we got more to do another two years. Thank you very much. doing 
in situ propellant demonstration in conjunction with the human exploration involved in the space the heads initiative which uh, JPL and uh, Johnson Center Space Center are working very closely together on so we have quite a number of payload elements on that 2001 mission including in situ propellant for that purpose to, to begin preparing honest to goodness for a human flight to Mars I should have known that would be popular here. <laughs> yeah. Will your uh, subsequent flybys of Europa allow you to compare, compare closely and see if there's been any movement of ice flows? Yes. Uh, well, we would love to see some motion. And uh, there's, of course, there's a limit to how much data we can take, but we're absolutely looking for that and absolutely looking for any comparison with the Voyager images or anything that would show that in this brief period of time there's been some motion. Uh, but you probably are, I think you had things on your program this uh, weekend that included uh, a magnificent idea of actually putting cryobot on Mars and going down through the ice. And surely we're going to do that in, I hope, during our, our careers. <laughs> And uh, there's an experiment that, similar to that at Lake Bostock that's going to be a, a pathfinder for that, hopefully. Yeah. Did the uh, stuck antenna cause a wobble in the spacecraft that you had to compensate for? No, it turns out that uh, the, the RTG booms are articulated. And what we do is we, just like balancing the wheel on your car, we adjust the booms. And had to do that anyway for propellant expulsion as we use propellant, the center mass booms. So we had to adjust those booms from time to time to, in fact, remove the wobble, which is a, another way of saying is to actually put the wobble axis or the principal axis of inertia on the center line. I can't tell you how desperately, during our campaign to open that antenna, I was looking for a wobble to start. <laughs> because that would mean that the moments of inertia had changed because the antenna had popped open. And, for, for, in case anybody doesn't know it, we did everything imaginable, including having a workshop at JPL and brought people in from all over the world and told them what we're doing. So, can you think of anything else we could do? And the answer was no, there's nothing else to do. And, uh, thank, thank goodness uh, for compression technology being what it was at the time and being able to essentially reprogram the spacecraft almost entirely uh, to do this job. There's some other. Uh, War stories about that that we don't have time for. Yeah. Uh, and when you were talking about things that were in progress, you didn't mention Cassini. Could you give us a little update on? Oh, sure. <laughs> That's a, uh, indeed Cassini launched on October 15th and just completed uh, the first of its two Venus encounters uh, completely successfully, and everything looks very good with Cassini. Cassini will reach. Uh, Saturn in 2004, I think it's July 1st or 4th, I don't know whether there's been, I think it's July 4th, in fact, and <laughs> politics are not to be left aside in these matters, <laughs> but in that, an interesting distinction for between Cassini and Galileo is that Cassini carries the probe into orbit, and after orbiting Saturn for a time, then releases the European, European Space Agency, Huygens probe, to Titan, and that it's not a requirement that it land on Titan, but only take atmospheric measurements as it goes through Titan, but every expectation is that it surely will survive the landing and continue to transmit. But Cassini is doing great, and uh, we're sort of looking forward to uh, the same sort of thing come 2004. Yeah. With all due respect to Io, if Europa is so interesting and, and why not just let it continue to rotate around Europa while well, Jupiter and Europa? Well, there's a balance. We, we feel that uh, the, the little tragedy that I didn't mention is in this scenario. You've asked, so I have to fill this in. The, uh, in the scenario where we had to redo the computers, reprogram the computers, we had a, invented a strategy for doing the mission that was entirely dependent upon, for imaging at least, on the tape recorder, which was a single, non-redundant, single point failure tape recorder. It was never there for imaging. It was there to protect the probe data in case we lost the Galileo to Earthlink during the one-time probe descent through the atmosphere. So that's why we had a tape recorder on board. 
So we had, when I had the antenna problem, we said, okay, we're going to use this tape recorder uh, very aggressively to store the imaging data because it's the only box storage device we had. So we stored until we could read it up at, at very low rate. Can you believe that two months before arriving at Jupiter, it looked like the tape recorder broke? We took, we took a PR picture of Jupiter on approach, took this picture, and then commanded rewind, and it never stopped rewinding. Just went and went and went. Like, so your VCR at home, if it doesn't stop, you figure, well, the tape's busted, or something's busted. And all the signatures were this thing was certainly busted. And here, after having done all this, it looked like we had no tape recorder for the imaging and other high-rate data. Well, in the space of two weeks, we figured out a way that we could get about something well less than 1, 10% of what we're going to get with the tape recorder by buffering through the central computer bulk memory, but still nothing like we had, we had hoped for. For that reason, and we had not figured out exactly what had happened in the details of the tape recorder turn. We knew pretty much, but not, not well enough to say we can use this tape recorder except for its essential purposes. So when one, we went by I.O., I made a very easy decision, but the most painful decision I've ever made, and that is that we did not use a tape recorder to image I.O. because we had to have it and maximize its uh, reliability record the pro data. So we didn't get remote sensing of IO, and we desperately want to get that, and we think we, this is the approach to do that. So we, again, it's a balance, and we think we're going to do real well on Europa. And another thing I didn't get the chan chance to mention, there's a big menu of 20 missions in 10 years, and one of those missions in 2003 we're planning to launch the Europa Orbiter. A spacecraft to Europa to go to Jupiter and then go into orbit around Europa, and uh, that'll uh, knock the socks off or of something like this. But the challenge, of course, is radiation. We had a hard enough time just flying this mission where we're just 10, 11 times going near the vicinity, that vicinity of the radiation, imagine operating in it continuously. That's, that's the real challenge. But that's going to happen. And in 2004, we're going to Pluto, the last one. And of all things, in 2007, we're going to finally go to the sun. Yeah. <laughs> and to get there, you won't believe that to get to the sun, you have to go to Pluto, to, to Jupiter first, to use a gravity assist from the Jupiter in order to get close enough to the sun. We want to get within four solar radii with our solar probe. But you can't, you can't, there's nothing powerful enough to drop you, to drop the uh, Herculean that far. So, so you have to go out to Jupiter and get a gravity assist to do it. Yeah. Uh, the uh, two Earth uh, passes, uh, did you s discover life on Earth? I know that was one of the questions yeah. that probably, <laughs> that, I mean, that's, 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 well, you're asking at least two questions. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, many of you probably know that Carl Sagan wrote an article about that. And there, in, in fact, he and colleagues looked at the Galileo data and said, could the Galileo spacecraft, with its instrumentation, determine if there was life on the Earth? And pretty much the conclusion was yes, but couldn't determine whether it was intelligent or not. <laughs> and uh, of course, we still can. <laughs> Back. Yes, uh, the particle detectors uh, that are on board the uh, orbiter uh, has it been used to do further research in lightning detection and that and the continuity of current from the uh, interior to IO? We had, uh, we had lightning detection on the probe and we did de detect quite a bit of lightning. Uh, Ten times the intensity that we typically see on Earth, but uh, less often by a uh, factor of 10. I understand the probe uh, that the orbiter can also yeah, the, in terms of the orbiter, most, mostly what say we, we try to do is image. But in the, uh, the fields and particles instruments, I know of no case where they have been, had any effectivity in terms of detecting lightning. But that, but that was the question. Yeah, because I was curious about the, about the sun, these uh, storms that occur 
if when you're aligned with the bio, if that kind of initiates lightning discharges that might be continuous in nature while they're... I've, I've not heard any uh, suggestion of that. Which well, doesn't mean that there hasn't been any. I, I just <coughs> not aware of it. Is Lou Lens already still... Uh, yes. Still involved? Yes, sir. Okay. He is, in fact, the PI for the lightning. But but I'm the probe, in fact. Did he release any of his papers on this yet? Pardon? Did he release any paperwork on oh, it? Oh, yes, there have been papers, quite a number. But uh, but again, it's probe based. The probe instruments. Okay, not the war. Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, you think, uh, when will uh, your funding round? <laughs> well, the, the funding for, for this mission, for Galileo, yeah. runs until the end of this decade. <coughs> That's their goal for one. Well, no. We expect, <laughs> what we're told is that you can use the money until it runs out. So you're uh, encouraged to save money as you go, so you have some left over. And the expectation is that there will be some money left over for a very low level operation. And what we envision is that after this extended mission, we would continue to operate the spacecraft in an engineering mode for the primary purpose of determining the radiation depth. See how the radiation effects ensue for information for how to design things like the Europa Orbiter mission. So that, that's the plan, but I, I experience, history has taught us that if we have a good operating spacecraft, usually the money can be made available to continue. Yeah. I'm unfamiliar with the Europa Orbiter mission. Um, what sort of instrumentation is it they're going to be? And in particular, um, what are you looking at for uh, penetrating the ice in terms of sensors and so on? Radar. Um, so the, the fundamental thing is radar to try to determine the... Have you yeah. selected a team for that yet? No. No, there's been no... The, the uh, announcement of opportunity for those three missions, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the Europa Orbiter, the uh, solar probe and Pluto and Kuiper Belt. It is a Pluto Kuiper Belt mission. Though that announcement is coming out this late this summer. The design is not been finalized. It's not finalized. No. At all. Well, there, it's well along, but not finalized. And, and particular instruments have not been finally selected. Yeah. I'm just wondering, keeping in mind all the uh, to do with Cassini, how are we going to power the Europa and Pluto probes? Uh, with uh, an advanced radioisotope power generation. <laughs> your, your point is well taken, and that political battle is not over very likely. And the thing that we're we're really struggling with is how are we going to convince the public that you can't use solar power for a spacecraft that's going to the sun? <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is that there's a 30,000 difference in uh, solar intensity between go out at Jupiter to get the gravity assist and in at the sun. So you, you have to have a system that will uh, accommodate that, and the only way we know to accommodate that is with advanced uh, radioisotope power. So that's our challenge. The others are more straightforward, of course. Uh, Pluto is uh, clearly appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> what trajectory will you follow on the Pluto mission? There, that is still to be determined. It's a, there is quite a bit of discussion about what, what launch vehicle may be available, and depending upon which launch vehicle, it can be a faster or a slower trajectory. And, uh, so hopefully, I, I believe the uh, expectation is it will be a flight time of the order of nine years. We have discounted the, the prospect of making it a 17-year flight on a small, very small launch vehicle. One more question. You, you pick it then, I don't want to be the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're the chairman. Peter, pick a, pick a person. Peter. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering with the extended mission on Galileo, what percentage of the total 
scientific package are you gonna of the total scientific mission will you get uh, from the original one before the antenna high gain antenna failed? Well, I would say hundreds of percent, and from the original uh, contract, because uh, remarkably, very remarkable, there was no Io or Europa encounter in this mission when it was approved by the Congress in 1977. None. Mm -hmm. So all of the discoveries at Europa basically were made possible by the uh, more aggressive approach that was taken after we once got the funding secured. So in, base, in terms of, you know, how do we do against what we set out to do? It surely did take longer than we planned on, but we've done uh, a, a great deal more than anyone expected when we embarked upon it. seeing a NOAA program, I believe it was, uh, the Rocky Road to Jupiter, perhaps some of you have seen it. Uh, uh, it was about the Galileo mission and how it took 10 years and uh, all the trials and tribulations. As Bill says, the agony and the ecstasy. Uh, Bob Bramshire uh, was our appointed man in inviting you here. And he suggested uh, that it would be appropriate that we give you some sort of award. <laughs> so uh, that put a challenge on the committee. I mean, what could we come up with? Uh, our chapter is called the Lunar Reclamation Society. And uh, well, uh, we've had a rocky road on the way to giving you this award. <laughs> uh, let me explain how what we came up with. Uh, one of our people had some art, art contacts and said he knew somebody who could fire a ceramic moon globe or a portion of a lunar globe. And he brought in a sample. And he said that they had also figured out how to put a metal object in it which was fired at the same time. So uh, we couldn't find any appropriate objects. And uh, finally, I hit upon the idea of the monolith of 2001, <laughs> which, which is not proprietary. If, for those of you who don't know, the dimensions are 1 by 4 by 9, which happen to be the squares of 1, 2, and 3, uh, which is sort of elegant. And so we decided to give called the, the Lunar Gateway Award, because the monolith was the gateway to Jupiter. And it's lunar is appropriate because the first body that Galileo investigated was the moon on, on a bypass approaching Earth. And we learned significant new knowledge about the moon from that. And then you continued to show us four more moons. You know, what is interesting is after um, after we learned that Venus was as hot as it is, Venus disappeared from the radar screens of our consciousness. Uh, but before that time, science fiction writers had concentrating on three worlds, Venus, uh, the Moon, and Mars, uh, the central uh, venues for our future. Then after that, it became just Moon and Mars, Moon and Mars, Moon and Mars. Now we're back to three again with Europa. Uh, I'm sure we're going to add to that more exciting places in the outer system, certainly Titan. But uh, anyway, uh, the prototype fired well. When, when, we, when, when they went to fire, when they went to fire the uh, the final design, uh, I guess it didn't work out too well. <laughs> and last week they tried again, and it didn't work too well. So we had good intentions. The base is done, the inscription is done, but we have the monolith, the beautiful black onyx. 
but the uh, ceramic flow we don't have. <laughs> so instead, we are giving you a certificate for the time being. <laughs> Certificate of Achievement presented by the National Space Society's 17th Annual International Space Development Conference, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, May 24, 1998, to Bill O'Neill, Galileo Project Manager Emeritus, for all the agony and ecstasy, ecstasy along the rocky road to Jupiter, its moons, Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and above all, to Europa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm, and I'm very honored to have this, and I'm particularly thrilled <coughs> that it's the first, because that's what we love to do at JPL first. So I'm, I'm delighted to have the first such award. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, never a doubt, right? <laughs> As Yoda said, there is no try, just do it. <laughs>